Hello, paramedic candidates. Welcome to our lecture on gastroenterology. Let's go ahead and get started. Four primary topics for this lecture include general pathophysiology, the critical assessment components that we'll talk about, generalized treatment, and then we'll get into some specific illnesses. As we look at this, I want to talk to you about some general information. If we look at about the number of gastrointestinal emergencies, they count for more than 500,000 emergency visits and hospitalizations every year. It's about 5% of all of the emergency room visits. Um, most of those, about 300,000 of those, are related to gastrointestinal bleeding. And so we really have to start to recognize what is the, the issue that might be happening? How is this issue coming to fruition? Is it an underlying issue that's now had an acute problem uh, because of a chronic related issue? Uh, and so forth. We also have to recognize that patients are treating themselves at home more and more, especially with GI-related issues. So oftentimes, they'll delay seeing their primary care physician and end up having an, uh, an acute emergency that requires our intervention. There's a lot of risk factors that are going to be associated with components of uh, uh, GI-related issues. Uh, things like uh, excessive alcohol consumption, excessive smoking, uh, increased stress, in, uh, ingestion of caustic substances, and then poor, poor bowel habits. Um, any number of these emergencies usually are going to result from some type of underlying pathological process that can be predicted, for the most part, by evaluating what risk factors are present. Does the patient consume excessive amounts of alcohol? Are they a smoker? Do they have really bad bowel habits? All those things are going to help us paint a pretty clear picture as to what we're looking uh, to get into. Now, when we think about your overall general physiology, pathophysiology, we know that we're going to see folks suffering from abdominal pain all the time. Well, what type of pain is it? We know that there's uh, three types of gastrointestinal pain. Visceral often is going to be described um, as vague or very poorly localized, dull or cramping-like pain. Uh, we know that hollow organ pain oftentimes is going to be very vague or nondescript, whereas pain from a solid organ typically is going to be more localized. Somatic pain is going to be uh, very specific. It's going to be very sharp in nature. And referred pain is going to be where you have pain that starts in one area and radiates uh, to another. Uh, Choliocystitis or gallbladder uh, is one. Um, another one could be where you're dealing with uh, colicky type gas pain that actually causes pain in the shoulder as well too. Or even that of a cardiac related emergency. Uh, but I would say to you the three main things to remember. Visceral pain varies. Somatic pain is specific and sharp, and referred pain refers to a different location otherwise found within the body. Now with that, that referred pain we talked about <clears throat> really is going to originate from another location. It's going to continue to progress to a different area. The th this type of pain, a referred pain, is not a true pain-producing mechanism, um, uh, which can oftentimes be a little bit convoluting. Um, as its name implies, referred pain originates in a region other than where it is felt. <clears throat> There's a lot of different natural pathways from various organs that pass through or over um, regions where that organ was formed uh, and during embryonic development. So for example, your afferent neural pathway that originates from the diaphragm enters the spinal column uh, at the level of the cervical enlargement of the four cervical vertebra. So what does that really mean? Well, basically, <clears throat> if they're having any type of issue where inflammation or injury of the diaphragm has occurred, oftentimes that pain follows that pathway up to their shoulder uh, or through their neck. One of the most uh, significant um, hemorrhagic emergencies that you can see is a dissecting aortic aneurysm or a dissecting aortic artery. Um, these produce pain that's actually felt between the shoulder pain or between the shoulder blades. That's not pain from where it originates. That's pain uh, that's radiating uh, or referred to a different location. Uh, appendicitis is another one where you get that periumbilical pain where um, pneumonia sometimes, you can even have pain uh, in your lower rib cages, right? So you've got a lot of different areas where referred pain can be felt. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's not valid or concerning type pain. Now the other thing that we look at here is Kern sign, uh, or Kerr's sign, I apologize. Um, basically, what does it mean? It means that there's going to be bleeding in the in the abdomen. It's going to be located in the in the upper uh, left hand quadrant, right behind your stomach, is your spleen, uh, and that's going to be where you'll feel that type of pain. So you'd palpate that upper uh, left hand quadrant, and you're going to get referred pain up to the shoulder, oftentimes, 
Um, that's a prime example that you could see where you're doing a, a, a positive curve sign. Another one with me is where you have their leg move up, you move their leg up like you would see at a 90 degree angle according to the picture, and they get really significant upper abdominal pain, specifically located on the left side. Uh, we're more concerned about a, a spleen like injury or spleen injury or rupture. So, what do we need to worry about with our general assessment? Well, our assessment really is going to be about what the patient's abdominal complaint is. So your assessment of a patient who complains of an abdom abdominal discomfort or who you suspect is having some type of abdominal or similar like traumatic injury, we're going to perform a relatively simple assessment like you would in any, any type of um, traumatic abdominal injury. Um, the approach that we're going to have is going to be a little bit different. We're going to make sure that there's seen as safe and that there's no identifying life threats or conditions that are apparent. We'll take our standardized precautions, but then we're going to start to move our focus predominantly into obtaining a really good history. Uh, your secondary assessment, which is your history, once you've completed that primary assessment and you've dealt with those life threats, you've you're going to conduct your secondary assessment. Your ability to get a good history from the patient is really going to depend on their level of consciousness. If they're unresponsive, well, it's going to be hard to get an OPQRST uh, ASPN. If you're not familiar with ASPN, that's Associated Symptoms and Pertinent Negatives. So other symptoms they may be showing and then things that are uh, not present, such as chest pain, uh, lack of chest pain would be an example of a pertinent negative. But we've got to make sure we can try to gather the history either from them or from the scene itself in order to be able to identify what issues might be going on. That includes things like looking at emesis. That includes things like uh, making sure that we have an understanding of their bowel movements, their history. Um, for female patients, maybe it's going to be related to a gynecological uh, issue or their, their uh, menstrual cycle. All those things become pretty important overall. You're going to find that that referred pain chart here, both anterior and posterior, are going to be pretty helpful for you because it's going to let you know where those different pathways were that referred pain would travel to. Again, the majority of them we'll discuss as we go through the specific medical emergencies. Now, again, your physical exam is probably one of the most important parts that I can uh, reiterate when it comes to your generalized assessment of a patient with abdominal-related issues. While you're conducting the history, you can also begin to conduct the physical exam. Use your patient's general appearance and their posture uh, are strongly going to uh, indicate the amount of distress that they may be on, how serious their complaint is. Um, if they're in a fetal position and they're hard to respond to you, that's going to give you a better clue that they're suffering some severe pain versus if they're just kicked back and saying, yeah, my, my stomach hurts. We also know um, we want to pay attention to the potential uh, for shock-related symptoms to develop. Remember, when you have an individual who's suffering from a GI bleed uh, or maybe even an acute assault of trauma uh, to the abdominal cavity, bleeding does not pop up immediately. We have to be on the lookout for that. So we must continue to monitor our patient's level of consciousness and watch for any subtle changes that may show signs of shock. We don't see massive bruising develop instantly on these patients. It does take time for that to be able to occur. We want to make sure that we get a good complete set of vital signs and that we're making sure that we're assessing things like pulse, respiratory rate, blood pressure, pulse oximetry, and then other factors that are important such as like uh, body temperature, believe it or not. Now, you're going to start your abdominal assessment by an inspection. Visually inspect the abdomen before you palpate it. Uh, oscillate it um, or moving the patient. We want to make sure that when you're doing your physical assessment, look before you do anything else, before you palpate, before you listen, or any of those components. You also have to make sure that you remove, expose your patient to be able to see what's going on. You can't find some of these ominous finds such as, uh, and the top picture is going to be uh, Colin sign, and then you have Gray Turner sign, which is the lower picture. You're not going to be able to see those unless you expose the abdomen. Uh, and oftentimes we do a really good job of that with our trauma patients, but not so much when it comes to our medical patients. We want to look for distension. Do we see where they have any type of distension that exists or swelling that exists? Um, uh, we know that the abdomen can hold a lot of circulating blood volume, um, four to six liters of fluid. That's a lot of fluid uh, before, the ab before the abdomen will actually begin to grow. Uh, other signs of fluid loss include paraumbilical ecchymosis or Cullen sign. That's the top one. And then you also have ecchymosis in the flank, which is Gray Turner sign. That's the lower picture that you will see there. When you oscillate the abdomen, um, it's going to provide a little helpful information. Not very helpful as far as that goes. We have to listen for at least two minutes to each quadrant. So now you're looking at a total of eight minutes to be able to assess if someone's GI tract is effectively moving. Realistically, in an emergency, that's not that important. It, again, it provides very little 
to know useful information in the end, so we really do not need to do a major movement. If you're concerned that there's a blockage or an obstruction, um, you can listen, but again, it's going to take a long time before you're going to be able to tell for sure if they just have a slow GI tract or if there's a complete blockage. Now, palpating the abdomen, on the other hand, gives us a plethora of information. It can identify the area of pain that's most common. Uh, it lets us know specifically what quadrant or what area geographically, what organ is going to be involved. Um, but we do know that before we palpate, we want to ask the patient where they're experiencing the most discomfort. Because they're experiencing discomfort, is that going to be the area that I want to push on right away? Well, no. Uh, an example could be a uh, AAA, abdominal aortic aneurysm. Like, so it hurts right here, so I press down on their belly. Well, what if I were to rupture that? That becomes a concern that I have. So ask the patient to point where they're experiencing the most discomfort, and then work in the reverse order. So if it's the worst pain is located in the upper right, start in the lower left and work your way up to that quadrant. It makes it a lot easier. Remember, when you palpate the abdomen, use gentle pressure. You're feeling for muscle tension or its absence, right? If they're guarding, you're going to see a lot more rigidity or tensing of those muscles. Um, we also want to wa watch for things like masses or palpitations uh, or pulsations, I should say, and then tenderness beneath that muscle. Um, remember, if you identify a palpating mass, you're dealing most likely with some type of blood vessel that's been affected. Last thing you want to do is press more. Stop. You feel a big low pulsating blast and it's the same rate as their heart rate, don't keep pressing it because you're, li you're likely to rupture that. And obviously that's going to lead to a really poor outcome for that patient. So let's talk generalized treatment because really a lot of this care is supportive care. You've completed your primary assessment, you've completed your secondary assessment, you focused heavily on your history and your physical exam, now you're ready to begin your treatment and your transport. Your highest priority when you're treating a patient with abdominal pain is to secure and maintain an airway breathing, and circulation. Remember your ABCs. No airway, no patient. Breathing, we're talking about rate and tidal volume. Minute volume. And circulation, we're talking about skin color, temperature, condition, along with vital signs to support that. Now, be prepared. If your patient vomits, and again, when you're dealing with a GI-related issue, vomiting is a very common occurrence, you need to make sure that you're prepared to suction the airway from vomitus or even blood, for that matter, if you're dealing with an upper airway uh, issue or even like uh, esophageal ruptures or a Mallory uh, Weiss tear. Now, the other thing we need to make sure is pay attention to their mental status because we know that the circulatory system and their ability to maintain is going to be focused based on that adequate perfusion that we typically see, right? So make sure the patient's awake and conscious and constantly evaluate their mental status. Also, we want to make sure the patient's placed in their cardiac monitor, that we're frequently assessing their blood pressure as a good indicator of their uh, hemodynamic stability. And then, uh, if possible, we're going to want to make sure that at the hospital at least, or if you're dealing with more of a, a service that deals with point-of-care testing, what's their measurement of their hematocrit? That's going to give us a really good indirect measure of their overall blood loss. Uh, lower levels of hematocrit means less red blood. Now, generalized treatment you're going to see, we talked about maintaining the airway, supporting breathing, that's a high flow, high concentrate action, assisting with ventilations. We know that if we're dealing with hypovolemia, uh, that oxygenation is very important. Uh, if we're dealing for something that may not be quite so related to hypovolemia, we're going to use our pulse oximetry to be able to titrate that to prevent hyperoxia and maintain that normal status in those patients. Um, part of that's going to be maintaining circulation, and that's going to be establishing a large bore IV line in a patient who complains of discomfort. Why do we need to do a large bore IV? Well, uh, and some people say, why is this even ALS? Well, if they're bleeding, What's the best fluid to replace? Blood. And if we're going to give blood, we're going to need to have a large enough IV catheter for us to be able to do that. Number one, we want to be able to reverse any type of hypovolemia with our isotonic crystalloid solutions. We also want to make sure that the, the IV catheter is going to be large enough for it to be able to accept blood. Uh, and we're also going to make sure we consider things like, do we hang blood tubing? Are we thinking proactive or thinking down the line to be able to help those patients overall? We want to make sure we get our cardiac monitor in place, make sure that the patient uh, is uh, uh, stable, uh, that we're not seeing signs of hypotension or tachycardia. Those are going to be classic signs of shock related to hypovolemia, most likely. We're going to want to uh, pay close attention to watch for any type of um, cardiac disturbances. Again, we know that when we lose blood, the heart is going to become irritated. We're going to get more likely to have some type of ectopic beats. Um, and then we want to make sure overall that our patient is comfortable that they're placed in a position of comfort. The best way to do that is going to typically be the fetal position, right? Let them kind of be able to curve curve up a little bit by drawing their knees up or placing your 
your tie in that knee flex position will actually loosen, uh, or not loosen, but re reduce the amount of tension that's on those abdominal muscles, makes them a little bit more comfortable as best as we can, and then provide that emotional reassurance. There's not a whole lot that we can do to identify the specific emergency that's happening, but we can be prepared for a deterioration in our patient, and we can do everything in our power to make sure that the environment is calm and comfortable and ready for your patient once they arrive uh, to the ER. A couple key factors to point out. Number one um, is uh, normally a rapid but gentle um, uh, transport is suffice. We don't always have to run lights and sirens unless we're dealing with something serious like a, an abdominal aneurysm that's burst or isn't expected to burst. Um, so that's number one. The second thing is, remember, uh, any time that you're going to be dealing with a patient who has persistent abdominal pain that lasts for more than six hours, that's a true abdominal emergency. So the onset and duration of the pain really does make a difference overall in making sure that they get transported to an appropriate facility. Um, the other aspect to think of is we never want to give anything by mouth. One, is they're likely to vomit, uh, and two, we could easily see a rapid deterioration in mental status if something were to become more prevalent. So we don't want to give nothing by mouth if possible. And then don't be afraid to go after your patient's uh, nausea and vomiting and treat that with Zofran. Uh, four milligrams IV Zofran is a great way. Um, you can do your uh, oral tablets, whatever it might be, but that's a great way to make sure that you can help make that individual stay as comfortable uh, as they possibly can. Now, as we look at specific illnesses, I'm going to kind of go over a, a number of different specific illnesses, but uh, we're going to start off just reviewing the generalized GI system. We're going to talk about issues within the GI tract, with the liver, with the gallbladder, with the pancreas, and the appendix. All those become uh, pretty important for us to, to focus on. When we think about the gastrointestinal system, the GI tract is essentially one big long tube, okay? Um, it's divided structurally and functionally into different parts. Uh, and there's three other organs that we typically would deal with. That includes the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. And they're all ultimately associated with, um, uh, with it, right, with the GI system. Um, there are some small structures that are going to be there, um, uh, like your appendix, uh, which is going to protrude basically off the large intestine. Which I'm still trying to figure out exactly what the appendix does for an individual, but it is one of those things that we want to be able to kind of watch out for. Now, collectively, these organs are called and referred to as the GI or digestive system. And we know the GI system converts food into nutrients uh, so that we, the body can function, right? We, we know that the body is dependent on oxygen and glucose. That glucose is the major component that the GI system is going to help us do. It also is there not only to give us nutrients, but to eliminate wastes from the body, solid waste and liquid waste from the body. Predominantly, when we're dealing with the GI system, we're talking about the solid waste. Again, you're going to see it starts in, again, the tip of your lips, tip of your nose, uh, predominantly your lips, your GI tract, it's going to travel all the way down. You are literally the one just big tube of guts, uh, as you want to look at it that way. So let's talk about some upper gastrointestinal uh, diseases. Uh, when we deal with the upper GI tract, we typically are going to divide it into upper and to lower. The upper GI tract consists of the mouth, the esophagus, the stomach, and the duodenum. The latter being uh, the part of the, the first part of the small intestines when you think about your um, uh, duodenum. Now, physical digestion of food and some um, chemical digestion does take place in that area of mastication, that chewing and breaking down with stomach acids and components. Uh, even some uh, things are absorbed directly through the stomach uh, and the stomach lining. Um, but physical digestion of food um, really happens more so in the lower GI tract as, as it travels. Um, through the large and small intestines. We know that nutrients are absorbed into the blood and solid wastes are formed and then excreted as, uh, as a stool through the form of a bowel movement. Uh, interestingly enough, you know that as <clears throat> your organs are going to, you're going to begin that process of, of uh, digestion. You eat, you swallow, it goes through your stomach, your duodenum, and then it's going to go um, from there down into the small intestines. The small intestines are going to be what really is going to uh, draw out all of the nutrients uh, that, that exists, and then from there, uh, as it travels through the large intestines, the liquid portion uh, is reabsorbed. So any liquid that can be saved uh, is then saved, and that obviously leaves us, hopefully, with an, a normal style of bowel movement. Now, if we look at the upper GI bleed-related issues, which is, are pretty common, we're talking about issues in the stomach, the esophagus, the stomach, and the duodenum. So upper GI bleeding can be defined as bleeding within the gastrointestinal tract that's proximal to the ligament of teres, um, which is what supports 
the duodenal junction, which is basically the point where we separate the upper and lower um, GI, right? It's the, the section where the duodenum and the, and, and the small intestine are gonna start to come together. Now, upper GI bleeds account for about 300,000 hospitalizations per year, as we talked about at the beginning of the lecture. The mortality rate has remained fairly steady. About 10% uh, of individuals who suffer from those will actually die from a GI bleed. So not everybody dies from it, but there are a lot of factors that contribute to high mortality in general. Uh, first is the number of patients who treat their symptoms with those home remedies, right? They do it with over-the-counter medications. Um, we see them more over-counter medications that were at one point in time prescription are now available. People are trying to deal with that early on, whether it's Tums, whether if it's antacids, whether if it's uh, antidiarrheal, uh, any of those things where they think that that's the, you know, oh, I've got stress in my system and that must be the cause when in all reality they have an onset of Crohn's disease. Uh, those are going to be some things that we take a look at. Secondly, age is another major issue. We know that as we age, your body doesn't do well with a disease, especially if you have other underlying um, core morbidities or core co-diseases. So those are some things that we really have to be able to closely pay attention to. Now, out of those folks that are likely to have an upper GI bleed or a GI bleed in general, knowing that's more prevalent than anything else in our GI lecture, what causes those? Well, there's six major identifiable causes of GI hemorrhage. Um, and we'll look at these in descending order of frequency. So what is um, uh, uh, more frequent versus less frequent? One of the big ones that we see are peptic ulcers. Someone gets an ulcer disease, uh, stress, cigarette smoke, alcohol consumption, all those things can lead to ulcers, uh, as many of you probably already know. Uh, gastritis, where we get inflammation in the gastrointestinal tract. That's another one that can be caused by be eating bad food with bacteria in it. Uh, it can be caused by excessive vomiting. Uh, uh, or uh, upset stomach, excessive acids, anything that could be caused by a number of other different components. Um, a variceal rupture is also referred to as a Mallory, 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 I can't talk, Mallory Weiss tear. Um, I've got some uh, images that I can show you from uh, uh, one of our adjunct instructors who actually had a Mallory Weiss tear from excessive retching, excessive vomiting. Um, we also see things like um, Esophagitis and duodenalitis is another one where we're again getting inflammation of, of the specific organs of the upper GI system. Now, most of these, you're going to see peptic ulcers, right? That's probably 50% of the upper GI bleeds we deal with um, uh, is going to be associated with peptic ulcer diseases, where they have an ulcer, it's a sore, it bleeds, uh, and it can become irritated very easily, and that bleeding can lead to an upper GI bleed. Most of the upper GI bleeds are going to be because of chronic irritation or inflammation of, of those underlying issues, right? They typically either have like minimal discomfort or they're going to have maybe just some minor bleeding, but it's an issue that's been going on for a very long chronic period of time, which raises its head when an acute problem develops because of it's been left unattended for so long. Now, most cases of these um, are going to be irritation or erosion of the gastric lining of the stomach. It causes about 75% of the upper GI bleeds that you're going to see. Now, realistically, your physicians can manage these conditions on an outpatient basis, but these folks are not going to the doctor. They're not the like they're not the individuals that are on top of their routine health care. Um, so that leads to an acute onset of a life-threatening and difficult to control like hemorrhage when we deal with an upper GI bleed. Now, a lot of these signs and symptoms that you're going to see are going to be pretty consistent as uh, overall. Um, you're going to see. Uh, things like generalized abdominal discomfort. You're going to see things where it may be like a vague or burning or an upset stomach. Sometimes it's like gas pain. Uh, it could be a tearing pain and sensation. Um, any of those other type of ones you're going to see. Oftentimes you're going to see them in the upper quadrants of the abdomen. Uh, you may see situations uh, where they present with nausea or vomiting. If there's a significant bleed of the GI system, uh, you can get components where you're having uh, hematemesis, right, where they're vomiting up bloody, bloody vomitous, um, as it passes down, that's if it's not fully digested. If it's gone through the lower GI tract, well, now you're going to be dealing, so this is small intestines on down, now you're going to get melina, which is going to be an example of a black, tarry-like stool, where that stool has been partially digested blood, right? And that's the way in which that it comes out. So concerns that we have, even though it may be an upper GI bleed, do they have changes with the signs of vomiting of blood or any type of signs of digested blood, that hematemesis or that melina. We're also going to pay close attention to common signs of 
<clears throat> coffee ground stool. That's another really common one, especially if they're having loose stool. If it's not black and tarry, oftentimes uh, you're going to see where you're going to have blood in the emesis uh, or, or blood in the GI tract uh, that's digested, and that looks like that coffee ground emesis if they're vomiting up that, that aspect. Um, we know that the upper GI bleeds may be light. Um, uh, they may be uh, brisk and life-threatening. There are a lot of major concerns that we have. We know that shock is one of the biggest concerns that I have. These types of hemorrhages can lead to classic shock symptoms, right? Alterations in mental status we're talking about, tachycardia, peripheral vasoconstriction. They're going to be excessively diaphoretic. They're going to have a lot of problems with uh, skin color, temperature, and condition, and ultimately become hemodynamically unstable. Now, besides shock, we know that vomiting itself can be a major airway compromise. So we want to make sure that we're paying close attention to their airway. Uh, is there any likelihood that they may have aspirated? Um, and if not corrected properly, when you're dealing with hypovolemia and signs of shock, along with vomiting and aspiration, it could ultimately lead to respiratory arrest and or cardiac arrest. Now, one of the also, also the more uh, frequently uh, employed clinical indicator is going to be the tilt test. Now, we don't generally do this a whole lot in the pre-hospital setting, but orthostatic vital signs are an important indicator to their overall stability. Um, so we want to see, do they have orthostatic hypotension? That's going to be, by definition, a 10 millimeter change in blood pressure or a 20 uh, beats per minute change in heart rate when a patient goes from a supine laying flat to a standing-like position. Uh, that can be a pretty good indicator uh, that they're having a problem maintaining because of a loss of blood volume. Now, when you're evaluating for these patients, um, we want to pay close attention uh, to their generalized appearance. We know that they're, uh, it's going to give us good clues to what the severity of their condition actually could be. We know that because hemorrhage uh, is internal, uh, it's often hard for us to be able to identify the amount of blood loss, and that history uh, that we get from our patient oftentimes can be very misleading. Uh, we've got to really do a good job of performing our physical exam to determine how severe our patient is when it comes to their overall stability. Um, when in doubt, let the patient lie still, keep them calm, um, and then recognize that a lot of the things that we're going to be doing <clears throat> are focusing on airway, breathing, and circulation. Those are some of the biggest concerns we have. In your physical assessment, look for scars. Look for past surgeries. See, do they have their gallbladder? Have they had their appendix removed? Have they had any other type of ulcers? Have they had any upper or lower GI scopes? All those things are going to be helpful as we look into uh, our, our patient's overall status. Most of your treatment um, is going to be, again, uh, making sure that the patient is uh, calm, comfortable. We're going to establish large bore IVs, be ready to produce our uh, isotonic crystalloid solution, a normal saline, 0.9% of sodium chloride. Uh, we're going to administer that for hypovolemic patients at 20 mLs per kilogram fluid bolus to tr correct and to treat any type of uh, hemorrhagic hypovolemia. We also want to make sure that the patient uh, gets, gets to the emergency department uh, as safely as possible. Um, and we recognize that they may have to do certain treatments like gastric lavage, gastric decompression, um, with a nasal gastric tube as well, uh, especially if they're having copious amounts of vomiting. Um, but really, a lot of those things are going to be things that focus on after our care is there. Our goal in this is to be able to di differentiate life threats from chronic problems. You can have a life threat from a chronic problem with an acute onset. That's what we want to focus on. What is the underlying problem? that's going on today. What was the acute issue today and what caused that based on our history gathering? Again, we talked about some of these different causes uh, that exist. When we think about uh, esophageal varices, this is a big one. Esophageal varices is a swollen vein of the esophagus. Um, often these varices will rupture and then hemorrhage and when they do, the mortality rate is over 35%. I had a call one time where a lady had just bought a brand new pickup truck um, pulled out onto the road, um, began to cough up, vomit excessive amounts of bright red blood. She was a regular routine user of alcohol um, and uh, basically died uh, in her brand new car uh, because of the amount of blood loss that she had in a very short period of time. By the time we arrived with the ambulance, we were only about three minutes away. Uh, by the time we got there, she was already in cardiac arrest, uh, and unfortunately, she was not able to uh, be resuscitated. But that just goes to show you how significant this was with uh, esophageal varices. Um, <clears throat> now, there's a number of different components that lead to esophageal varices. The most common is going to be an increase in portal hypertension or portal pressure. 
Um, we know as blood flows through the abdominal organs, it's done through the portal vein uh, where it fills into the liver, where nutrients are absorbed uh, into the liver and tissue, and numerous com uh, compounds there are detoxified uh, to make sure that the blood that's returning back to the body is healthy. Um, now, blood flow that flows through the river usually has no major issues, right? It doesn't get any resistance as it travels through. But if you're having underlying issues with your kit, uh, with your uh, kidneys, or pardon me, your liver, uh, it's going to definitely lead to the increase in that pressure. That pressure backs up uh, and actually leads to these bulging of these uh, 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 vessels within the esophagus. Uh, it literally is the exact same cause why people get hemorrhoids. Uh, it's just on the other end. Portal hypertension is a big one. Uh, in that case, mostly because of st stress and strenuous pushing uh, to relieve a bowel movement. Uh, but the same thing can happen on those who are chronic alcohol, uh, uh, chronic alcoholics um, or who have liver cirrhosis. Uh, you can also have a lot of problems where you can get this where maybe we don't have portal hypertension, but ingesting of caustic substances can erode that away and cause massive bleeding to occur very, very quickly. Um, and again, this can very easily uh, be life-threatening. That's the biggest concern that we have for these patients that are suffering it <clears throat> from it. Um, because we can't control the bleeding, we can't tampen on it, we can't stop it in the pre-hospital setting, your care should really focus on aggressive airway management. That includes IV fluid resuscitation, rapid transport to the emergency department. Um, I can tell you uh, the amount of uh, blood that we suctioned out of that uh, female suffering from esophageal varices um, was almost four liters of blood. It was two uh, thousand, uh, 2,000 cc uh, suction canisters that we filled. And that, that wasn't even to mention what was left uh, on the scene or in her car or truck, I should say. So those are some key things just to kind of keep in the back of your mind that this can go sideways really quickly and suctioning is going to be really, really important. In addition to that, maintain that airway includes maximizing oxygenation. That includes high, high flow, high concentrated oxygen, especially if the patient's hypoxic. And then be aggressive when it comes to uh, to your shock therapy. All those are pretty concerning um, aspects uh, of bleeding control or major other components that you'll see. Again, we talked about that chronic alcoholism, cirrhosis, the ingestion. This is a, one of those ways that you can actually see them tampon on that. Um, it has an esophageal balloon. I cannot even pronounce this. It's a Blakemore tube is what, how I refer to it as. But it gets uh, inserted just like a GI uh, 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 nasal gastric tube would. And it goes in, it's going to have a balloon, it's going to inflate, and it's going to help uh, tampon on that bleed. If that can be placed, great, but uh, oftentimes it can be life-threatening before we even get to that point. Now, most of the signs and symptoms we've talked about, uh, hematoemesis, uh, dysphagia, painless bleeding coming from the mouth, uh, they're going to have a lot of signs of hemodynamic instability, and classic signs are shock, hypotension, tachycardia, altered mental status. And then remember your general treatment guidelines. Be aggressive with your airway. Make sure that you're focused on aggressive fluid therapy and get them to the hospital just as quickly as you possibly can. Now, one of the other areas that you can see with uh, bleeding is going to be with the Mallory Weiss tear. A Mallory Weiss tear is where we get a tear within the esophagus. It's a mucosal layer that becomes ripped or torn. Uh, prolonged vomiting or excessive vomiting uh, really can cause some of these major components. So you can have someone that is the stomach flu. Um, but actually starts vomiting copious amounts of blood, uh, that's because they have a tear in their esophagus or a tear in that mucosal lining. Again, airway management and aggressive fluid therapy is important. Here's an example of uh, Kevin Hetherington is the gentleman's name who actually had this. These are pictures provided by him. Well, how bad can it be? He had a, a, retch of, a bound of retching with some vomiting, uh, and this is just the amount of blood. It's kind of dark and dried now, but you can see the amount of blood that actually came up because he had a small Mallory Weiss tear. Uh, it was able to be surgically corrected. Uh, Kevin's here today, thank, thank the Lord, but uh, you can definitely see how significant it became so quickly. Let's switch gears a little bit to uh, acute gastroenteritis. This is basically inflammation of the stomach and the intestines associated with a sudden onset of vomiting and or diarrhea. It gets a lot of people, three to five million people every year world, worldwide and it accounts for about 20% of hospitalizations of all patients. A lot of people that end up calling an ambulance or going to the hospital because of this onset of vomiting and or diarrhea. The pathological inflammation causes uh, hemorrhage, uh, and it can cause erosion of the mucosal and submucosal linings, linings of the gastrointestinal tract. Um, so you can kind of see here is that you get these 
different layers of the duodenum that are going to become affected. Um, this inflammation and this erosion can turn into damage uh, and then basically uh, makes it so the body can't effectively absorb water and nutrients. Uh, and the water that health is, is, is healthy and needs to normally be uh, absorbed now continuously moves through at a rapid rate. That's why we get such excessive diarrhea in these individuals. Um, and that's why we see uh, more commonly is secondary sy symptoms associated with things like dehydration from vomiting and diarrhea, which on its own can be a significant component. We also know that there's a number of other risk factors that are associated with these. Um, those that use tobacco or alcohol, again, chemicals, uh, ingestions, things like NSAIDs, or uh, even uh, certain types of chemotherapy if they're getting radiation. Um, any of those things can be major risk factors that can lead to problems with acute gastroenteritis. Um, and it's usually rapid and it's pretty severe um, when we're dealing with these individuals. Uh, we've got to make sure that we're prepared for them to progress. And remember, a lot of times people wait until they've gone as long as they can. They're dehydrated, they're weak, they may be hypoglycemic, they may be having um, bleeds that have begun to develop now. Um, they're going to be pale and just look sick. They often wait that long before they end up calling us to help them. So what are we looking for? It's a rapid onset of severe vomiting and diarrhea. We're paying close attention to the digested blood, the melina, or if we're dealing with hematemesis, hem uh, where they're vomiting up that blood. We're looking at generalized diffuse abdominal pain, very visceral pain. We're dealing with a lot of hollow organs, so that pain's going to vary. But we do have signs and symptoms of shock that it can occur, either to dehydration or potentially even a bleed. Most of your treatments are going to be pretty simple. Keep them in position with their head forward um, or face to the side if you're thinking, excuse me, that they're going to be vomiting significantly. Um, that's a major component. Keep them so that they're comfortable. We want to make sure that airway, airway, airway is the top priority, especially when it comes to aspiration during vomiting. Make sure that they can maintain adequate oxygenation. And if there's no significant blood loss, uh, the circulatory system's oxygen cap capabilities remain intact. Give them, some, uh, give them some oxygen. You're not worried about their inability to carry oxygen, but we are worried about their uh, dehydration status, how, how much fluid, how much volume have they lost, and we can replenish that. Um, again, we want to make sure that the quick, quickest and easiest route to address that is through IV fluid administration. Um, in the pre-hospital setting, again, 0.9% sodium chloride or, or LR is another appropriate isotonic solution that we can use to increase or fill that circulating volume. In addition to that, there's a lot of different aspects of medications that you can give uh, pharmacological treatment-wise. Antiemetics, the most common one you're going to see uh, is Lodanzotron or Zofran, uh, 4 milligrams. That's probably the biggest, most common one that you would see. We want to avoid things by mouth, so IV is probably your best bet to go ahead and give that along with that IV fluid to rehydrate them. Um, and then make sure that you're recognizing that anytime that they're vomiting, uh, we're going to be losing electrolytes. If they have diarrhea, they're losing electrolytes. That may lead to... Uh, some form of metabolic alkalosis or metabolic acidosis. Um, and then we also have to remember that whatever caused them to have this acute gastroenteritis, we want to be careful not to catch it ourselves because a lot of those uh, are from pathogens. So we have to take extreme concerns when it comes to our standard precautions uh, and any patient where we think it may be caused by some type of infectious disease. Now, gastroenteritis is another one that you're going to see. This is a similar to gastroenteritis. Uh, but this is a long-term issue. So chronic is a, probably a better way of referring to this one, uh, gastroenteritis, is going to be inflammation of the gastrointestinal mucosa marked by long-term mucosal changes or permanent mucosal damage. Unlike acute gastroenteritis, chronic gastroenteritis is predominantly due to my, uh, microbial infection. So what does this mean? It means um, uh, they've probably ingested something bad. If you've ever watched any of the survival shows uh, where someone decides to drink some water that's been standing in a pool uh, that is basically a, cess a cesspool for any other type of uh, 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 bacteria, uh, you're going to get where they're going to get very, very sick because of it. Um, and there's a number of different components that we'll see there. But we know it's predominantly caused by that microorganism infection. And it's definitely not as prevalent here in the United States as it is in underdeveloped or developing countries where they don't have ac access to clean running water uh, or water that's been treated. They're, they're dependent on water that is available, which may not necessarily be the cleanest uh, or healthiest. 
Um, all these microbes that are going to be associated with gastric disorders are, again, much more common in those other or uh, other countries uh, that are less developed. But you can see things where if we're having any type of fecal oral transmission uh, because of poor personal hygiene or poor food prepara uh, preparation or food handling, that can also lead to uh, an, uh, an issue where we're dealing with more of a, a chronic gastroenteritis. Now, most of these patients are going to present um, with generalized uh, nausea, vomiting. They may have fever, diarrhea, abdominal pain, cramping. Um, they may just not want to eat or take anything in. Obviously, it's going to make it worse. They're going to be very tired. Uh, and in severe cases, they may even have some types of shock. Now, most of the time when we're dealing with these things, we're going to be uh, dealing with underlying issues as well where they may just present with like, I've got some heartburn, or I've got some abdominal pain, uh, maybe they've got some gastric ulcers. That, on top of this, can really lead to some acute issues uh, or exacerbation of underlying conditions. Um, so kind of keep that in mind. Most of the treatment, like we talked about, is about protecting yourself, making sure you stay safe from any type of uh, further contamination, monitor the patient's airway, breathing, circulation, transport them, um, try to do everything you can to make sure that you keep them as comfortable and calm as you can. And then uh, once you're arriving at the hospital, a lot of the generalized care that will continue on will be based on uh, diagnosing uh, or treating the specific symptoms or what that infectious disease might be. Peptic ulcers. Boy, if you don't have peptic ulcers by the time you complete a paramedic program, uh, you probably you probably will, but uh, or at least work in EMS for a long time because our industry uh, leads to a lot of the GI-related issues. We don't eat very well. We're under high stress all the time. We don't hydrate very well. Uh, a lot of alcohol consumption, uh, smoking and caffeine consumption, all of those things lead to uh, issues where we're dealing with peptic ulcers or erosion that's caused by excessive gastric uh, acid. Now, they can occur anywhere within the GI tract, right? But we're going to kind of really focus on some of the more common areas um, based on where they specifically are located. Uh, duodenal ulcers, guess where they're located? Uh, in the duodenum. Um, or the, you can see right here is the duodenum. Uh, there you have your duodenal ulcer uh, that exists. Um, we also are going to have things like um, gastric ulcers that can exist. Uh, you can have ulcers within your esophagus. Um, really, they can kind of happen almost anywhere. Now, overall, peptic ulcers occur in males four times more uh, than they do in females. Duodenal ulcers occur for about two to three times more frequently than gastric ulcers do. So it's more common for you to get uh, ulcers in, in your uh, distal from your stomach. Um, out of all of these, what happens? Well, there's a couple key indicators that let you know someone has a peptic ulcer. Um, usually their pain is going to increase after eating or when they have a full stomach. Uh, usually this is more so worse at, uh, during the day and they usually have no pain at night. Uh, duodenal ulcers are going to be a little bit more of, of a different component. Um, you're going to find that those uh, oftentimes with duodenal ulcers have pain at night or when their stomach is empty. Uh, so they're very similar but they're very different at the same time. It's very hard for us again in the pre-hospital setting to say, well, you have a duodenal ulcer or you have a gastric ulcer uh, or you have a peptic ulcer. We aren't going to go through that process of diagnosing it, but it's important to recognize that questions of like, well, did you eat and the pain came on? Is it at night? Is it during the day? Do you feel better when you eat? All those questions oftentimes can help you get to the root cause that the individual may have some type of ulcer. Most of the signs and symptoms we talked about is abdominal pain, um, uh, generalized uh, discomfort. They may have acute pain that's developed. Uh, they may have vomiting of blood. They may have the, the uh, vomiting of digested blood. Any of those major components uh, you may see. Most of the, your generalized treatment that you're going to see is really going to be focusing on uh, making them comfortable, uh, doing what we can to uh, get them to the hospital. Uh, we can consider the administration of histamine blockers, so your antihistamines. Uh, we know that uh, diphenhydramine is not recommended for ulcers. Um, but we do know that it does help reduce stomach acid. It has H1 properties, so it's histamine properties, which are located, uh, H1 and H2, which are located within the GI system to help alleviate some of that. Um, and then they may need to take antacids. The thing is, you got to be careful that they don't take too many antacids where they end up creating a metabolic alkalosis, uh, as we talked about in our previous uh, acid-based lecture. So the treatment for these are really going to be based on the severity of the patient's pain, um, we're going to have a, a patient who have abdominal pain or hemodynamic in, in, uh, instability are going to require 
Um, comfortable positioning, it's a lot of psychological support, uh, high concentrated oxygen if they're hypoxic based on a bleed of some kind, IV fluid for administration for fluid resuscitation and pharmacological intervention when it's necessary, and then transport to an appropriate facility able to take care of them. Um, again, we talked about those uh, mucosal irritation uh, being reduced by uh, uh, histamine blockers. Um, those are probably the more common ones, or you'll see where you'll have protein pump inhibitors um, like Prilosec, uh, uh, any of those other ones that you may commonly see over the over the counter. Nexium, those all help reduce the amount of acids produced in the stomach, and antacids as well too, like Tums or Rolaids, things of that nature. Again, our care is going to focus on making sure that they're comfortable, airway is protected, and we transfer them to the hospital. Uh, peptic ulcers, when we're dealing with peptic ulcers, again, it's erosion caused by gastric uh, acid. Um, you have zollinger allison syndrome, um, basically is where you get this buildup of tissue um, because you have excessive hyperacidity. Uh, you end up getting duodenal ulcers that are beginning to develop, uh, and then it can actually lead to uh, impacts of the pancreas as well, too, uh, because it's constantly secreting lots and lots of gastric juices to be able to help break down um, whatever they're eating. Well, that can lead to some issues with the, uh, ulcers as well, um, especially if you're dealing with a blocked pancreatic duct where they can't release those major components. Lower GI bleeds occur in the GI tract that's going to be distal to the ligament teres. Uh, the lower GI hemorrhage uh, generally occur more frequently in conjunction with other chronic disorders and other anatomical changes associated with advanced aging. So getting older or having underlying issues all become pretty common. Uh, again, we talked about some of those more common associated issues that you're going to see. Now, your assessment as you're dealing with these patients, your assessment for lower GI bleeds really should be focused on, a, on a, well, in essence, should be identical to your assessment of those that are upper GI bleeds, for that matter, because we really can't distinguish between the two in the field on our own. But after you've completed your primary assessment, you've tre treated any life-threatening conditions, you move on to your secondary assessment. First, ask the patient whether this is a new or a chronic-related issue. If it's a chronic-related issue, check the abdomen visually for scars from previous surgeries, and, and then what other type of frequent complaints have they had? Um, maybe they've had cramping or other issues, gas-like pain, nausea, vomiting, or even changes in their stool. We know that um, melanic stools are usually going to be associated with a lower GI bleed, uh, and if the stool contains a bright red blood, uh, the hemorrhage is either very large, just as passing through the intestinal system before it actually can be digested or broken down, or we're dealing with something that's occurring on the distal end of the colon where it's more of an acute onset of a related issue. We also know that later causes uh, can be things like hemorrhoids. Uh, hemorrhoids oftentimes are going to lead to this progressive uh, blood that's in the stool, but oftentimes it's going to be associated with blood on or around uh, a normal bowel movement. But folks are going to call for both and not be able to tell if it's a hemorrhoid or if it's an actual uh, true lower GI related emergency. We know that we want to follow our generalized treatment pattern as we had for anyone else, watching for early signs of shock. We're less worried about upper airway, but we're definitely worried about fluid loss, blood loss, all those things that are going to lead to that onset of hypovolemic shock. Ulcerative colitis is classified as an idiopathic inflammatory bowel disorders, or IBD. That's basically, it's one that's of unknown origin. We really don't understand exactly where or how it's developed, um, but it is something that we typically will see. Um, we know that it's going to have an effect on uh, chronic ulcers or that creates uh, continuous length of uh, chronic ulcers uh, of the mucosal layer of the colon. Um, there's a lot of factors that can lead into this. Uh, it could be psychologic or, uh, psychological, uh, allergic, toxic, environmental, immunological, and infectious as well. About 75% of all ulcerative colitis uh, uh, situations are going to involve the rectum, um, and then a portion of the large intestine as well, too. And the inflammatory process usually starts in the rectum and then extends proximal through the colon, and then it sometimes also can affect uh, the entire large intestine if it can progress that uh, uh, severely. Um, and if it does spread throughout the entire colon, um, it's called uh, palancholiitis. Most of the signs and symptoms that you're going to find, um, it's going to be differentiated from other uh, causes of lower GI bleeds. Um, because of its presentation. We really don't understand exactly what it is. We commonly will see occasional bloody diarrhea or a stool that's containing a significant portion of mucus, colicky abdominal pain or cramping-like pain, uh, nausea, vomiting. Occasionally, you may notice it with a fever and some weight loss, uh, and then in severe cases, obviously, signs and symptoms of shock if it progresses uh, to that point. Uh, most cases are going to be pretty uh, consistent overall uh, with those basic components. 
The management really depends on the patient's uh, physiological status. Uh, we want to pay attention for their uh, shock and treat if necessary. And then, uh, again, antiemetics, uh, antispasmodic medications, especially for the cramping inside the abdominal uh, organs, can actually help out significantly as part of that. With Crohn's disease, again, Crohn's is another disease, just like idi uh, idiopathic inflammatory bowel disorder. We really don't know what the actual cause is, but we know it does affect the entire GI tract. Um, we definitely see it more in Western uh, Hemisphere uh, than we do anywhere else in the world. Um, uh, specifically, um, uh, those that tends to have run where it runs in the family uh, and most prevalent among white females, those typically under uh, frequent st stress. Now, unlike ulcerative colitis, the effects of the, uh, this affecting the large intestine, Crohn's disease can really happen anywhere within uh, the GI tract, really from the mouth all the way to the rectum. And then you're dealing with between 35 to 45 percent of less severe cases that are going to involve only the small intestine, about 40 percent of that. You're looking at are going to be rare problems uh, where we're dealing with any other abscess or fistulas that collect later on. Um, <clears throat> you can lead to some major issues with a lot of the damage to the muscle um, because we're getting this hypertrophy and fibrous of underlying muscle. So it's going to get hard. Uh, it's going to get very uh, inflexible. We get gran uh, granomalous, which are going to begin to form and develop and break down and break down that mucosal and submucosal layers even more so. Uh, and then happens as it goes all the way down through the GI system. Um, sometimes you're going to deal with active lesions. Uh, you're going to deal with a, lo a lot of uh, scar tissue that's going to begin to form up. Um, and then it leads to tears in the blood vessels uh, and those mucus layers. And again, we're going to result in a significant bleed. Um, some of the same pathological patterns of ulcers and scarring that can lead to a creation of these fistulas, you're most commonly going to see between the lengths of the small intestine <clears throat> or eventually we're going to be dealing with an obstruction of the small bowel. Um, these are all really, really major components that we typically will see. Now, how does it present? That's probably the most important aspect for us to be able to take a look at this. Um, Crohn's patients clinically presentations are going to have a very dramatic wide um, spread, right? The spectrum that can happen with Crohn's really depends if it's under control, if it's in remission, um, if it's managed, what have you. Um, but as the disease prog progresses gen uh, generically, we know that the pre-hospital diagnosis is going to be difficult next to impossible for you to be able to determine. But we want to pay attention to what some of those common signs are. So common signs symptoms include weight loss, intermittent abdominal cramping, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, even a fever. Now on the onset of a flare-up, the disease is active, is rapid, it requires uh, immediate treatment because of its, how uncomfortable uh, and the amount of symptoms that the individual is going to have. Uh, you're going to find that the physical exam will produce nonspecific, non-localized, diffuse tenderness throughout the abdominal cavity. Uh, and <clears throat> absent bowel sounds in a patient with Crohn's disease is strongly indicative of an intestinal obstruction of some kind, which truly could be a surgical emergency. And because the, the vast majority of the patients that we're going to be seeing with Crohn's are hemodynamically stable, the pre-hospital treatment is pretty, pretty generic, uh, mostly largely palliative. In this case, we want to make sure that we recognize their psychological status, that we provide them their calm, uh, we make sure that we reassure them. We are concerned about nausea, vomiting uh, from an aspect of aspiration, an airway control, maybe needing to administer oxygen if our patient is hypoxic. Um, good vital signs are always important. Uh, and then be prepared to administer um, intravenous fluids if you're seeing the signs of dehydration and or shock. Now with diverticulitis, diverticulitis is a little bit different. Diverticulitis is, is a relatively common complication of diverticulosis. Um, diverticulosis is a condition characterized by the presence uh, in the intestines of diverticula, um, which are these little out po poachings, uh, pockets, if you will. Uh, they can easily become uh, clogged or um, blocked with seeds or nuts or uh, <clears throat> any type of food that can lead to uh, an inf infl inflammation and infection. Um, out of these, you're going to see that they are very common in the elderly, uh, and your signs and symptoms are going to be based on abdominal pain and tenderness, fever, nausea, vomiting, and then some of those signs and symptoms of GI bleeding. Um, most of this is, is a two-fold process. The first is where the stool is going to pass very sluggishly through the colon, and it's a condition that's associated with typically low-fiber diets, um, uh, especially in developed countries like here in the United States. Uh, the colon responds by having muscle spasms, which actually tries to increase the bulk movement 
by raising the pressure on the contents inside the colon and beginning to push the fecal matter forward. Um, <clears throat> the second aspect of it has to do with this outpoaching um, or these pockets that you're going to find uh, in the colon tissue made up of these fibrous bands of muscles and they're wrapped around one another. And among those muscles, you, you have different nerves and, and, and blood vessels, all of which are going to enter through the colon through those small openings. Um, and as the opening becomes blocked or inflamed, it's going to lead to pressure um, and it leads to the forming of that um, diverticula. Um, these become weakened as you age, uh, and the increased pressure of the mu and muscle spasms cause that lining of the layer to become stretched, both the mucosa and the submucosa, um, to where you actually can get herniations that will or openings that will happen, um, which form that diverticula. So again, really, what are you going to do for these guys? It's going to focus on supportive care. We, uh, the measures to counteract any type of hypovolemic shock um, only when there's signs of hypovolemia that exist, we need to go after that. That includes oxygenation, as we talked about before, and the use of those antiemetics as well, too. Now, these folks are probably going to need the use of antibiotic therapy. They're going to probably have some type of, of scope and radiological tests that are going to be done to locate the diverticula. And most of the long-term treatment really focuses around a high-fiber diet to keep things moving forward as they should. Here's an example where you can see uh, normally we have a nice smooth lining of the uh, mucosal lining or submucosal lining, and here you can easily start to see some of those pouches that begin to develop because of that pressure as it tries to move forwards. Oh, good Lord, no one likes to talk about hemorrhoids, but let's talk about it <laughs> and get into the details. Um, these are small, swollen masses of veins that occur uh, in the anus, right? Uh, typically external or in the rectum, which could be internal. Uh, they're frequently developed uh, during uh, the uh, fourth decade of life. So you typically have to be about 40 years old before you start to have some of these. And most of these are idiopathic. Again, we don't know exactly why and they, they have uh, come to be. Most likely, uh, our external hemorrhoids are often a result of either from heavy strenuous lifting or bearing down. And then they also can include from things from like straining from defecation if you have a very low fiber diet. Um, hemorrhoids are pretty common right? Overall, uh, anyone that's over 50, if you have blood in the stool, the first thought I have is, okay, is there a possibility of some type of, of hemorrhoids, either internal or external? In most cases, you're going to find that the morbidity is extremely low in most cases, um, unless they're alcoholics, and then they have a higher likelihood of having um, portal hypertension, which leads to esophageal varices, problems with your liver, and then, yes, hemorrhoids as well, too. Most of the treatment, to be honest with you, with these guys, uh, you're just going to go ahead and keep them comfortable. Uh, you're going to see hemorrhoids uh, are a very common call because it produces uh, bright red bleeding uh, and oftentimes pain and defecation. Physical assessment, normal, healthy, hemodynamically stable individual. Um, they've got pink, warm, dry skin, but they've got a significant amount of blood in their toilet, and it does create some anxiety. Um, most of the stuff that we're going to do in the pre-hospital setting is really going to be focusing on keeping them calm and comfortable. Uh, transporting them in a position of comfort uh, because we can't always tell if it's a hemorrhoid or if we're dealing with some other major underlying issue. Maybe it's Crohn's disease. Maybe it's a, um, any number of the other lower uh, GI-related issues that we have talked about. Bowel obstructions are another big one that we can commonly see. Um, <clears throat> these bowel obstructions can be caused by a foreign object um, uh, where something's inserted into the rectum for various different reasons. Um, it could be psychosis, it could be for sexual satisfaction, whatever it might be. Um, anything that's, that's inserted uh, uh, can also pass uh, into the lower GI tract from the upper GI tract. So um, oftentimes things like gallstones or uh, things that can be released that way will travel down through and can lead to an obstruction as well in the bowel. Um, so it's not always things going in, but it could be things coming down, trying to go out that can get obstructed as well uh, as far as that goes. When we think about actual bowel obstructions, we're talking about blockage of the hollow space of the small or large intestines. And again, it can be partial or complete. A lot of these things uh, that for cause-wise could be things like hernia, uh, it could be uh, adhesions, it could be an infarction of the bowel, any number of these areas where we can see concerns um, that are going to go there. And you can see the different types that we have. Hernia, obviously, this is the one that we're pretty commonly familiar with. When someone gets a hernia, it's an outpouching of the intestines through the muscle wall. Um, you can have uh, where we have uh, interception, where we're getting uh, basically the part of the colon uh, or a bowel will go over another section and creates a double flap. Um, basically, kind of telescopes, if you want to think about it that way. 
Um, Movalis is another one where you're dealing with a twisting uh, of the bowel. That's a major concern with it becoming ischemic or infarcting. Um, and then obviously you can have a multitude of, of, of adhesions, all of which could have an impact as well too. Most of the signs and symptoms, you're going to find the patient um, going to pr produce um, diffuse visceral-like pain, very difficult to, for it to be able to be localized. Um, they may be hemodynamically unstable, but most of the time they're going to be hemodynamically stable. Um, you're going to see things like distension, peritonesis, uh, or uh, free air within the abdomen, abdominal cavity, so a lot of excessive air, uh, either hyperactive bowel sounds or absent bowel sounds. Remember, they're not very effective as an assessment tool in the pre-hospital setting. And a lot of this is really going to be focusing on making sure your patient is as comfortable as they can be, right? If you're going to palpate, uh, palpate very lightly, If especially if you suspect any type of obstruction. Just remember, an additional pressure may actually rupture that um, obstructed segment. We want to be very careful to provide that support of oxygen therapy, airway management, treating for shock, the things that we've continuously talked about so far throughout this lecture. We're also dealing with accessory organ diseases, which include the liver, gallbladder, pancreas, um, and then the appendix as well, too. Um, <clears throat> appendicitis, we've talked about. Uh, it's an it, impactment that typically happens of the appendix, um, very common in children and young adults. Um, it, it leads to a generalized infection, um, which if that uh, appendix were to rupture, uh, it's going to leave lots and lots of gastric secretions throughout the uh, abdominal cavity. It's going to lead to a lot of irritation, inflammation, and infection. We know that with McBurney's points, a big one that we look at, but I like to just remember right lower quadrant abdominal pain is most likely going to be associated with an appendicitis. We also are going to see things like rebound tenderness. Rebound tenderness is where you press in and it doesn't hurt, but as soon as I lift off of it, that's when the pain is recreated. That's an example of a, of a positive uh, of, uh, rebound tenderness uh, located at the point of McBurney's point. Uh, most of this is going to be watching for low-grade fever, nausea, vomiting, um, it's very difficult for you to be able to tell what's going on initially, um, but we want to keep an eye that if there's a low-grade fever uh, and there's issues where we're dealing with uh, uh, right lower quadrant pain, that we focus heavily uh, into that. Most of the care you're going to provide is supportive, psychological support. Uh, make sure we're diligent with our airway as we talked about, establish an IV access. Most likely they would need surgery if, if it truly is an appendicitis um, to be able to try to get that before it does rupture. Um, if it has ruptured, it can be a much more serious state, um, especially if uh, they can become uh, hemodynamically unstable because of that. Choliocystitis, also known as gallbladder disorder, right? Uh, it's inflammation of the gallbladder. Um, basically, uh, it has to do with the formation of gallstones a lot of times. Cause about 90% of the choliocystitis cases that we see uh, in the adult population. Um, again, <clears throat> what's going to happen here? As we can also have components where we're dealing with chronic choliocystitis, which is a bacterial infection. Um, again, it's another common one that you potentially could see. Um, but definitive treatment is really important for these folks. They're going to need to be able to get a laparoscopic surgery. They're going to need ultrasound treatment to potentially break up any gallstones. Um, a lot of those th therapies can fail as well, too. Um, and so there is a potential for some concerns with that. Um, we know that choliocystitis being caused by gallstones can be both acute or chronic. Um, you know, the liver produces bile, uh, and the primary vehicle for removing that cholesterol from the body is that bile. And that bile um, is going to be what travels down through the common bile duct and empty into the small intestine. Um, and from that point, it's going to continue to help break down some of those fats uh, that you could typically see. Um, other aspects that we typically take a look at with this, really as far as management goes, um, like we said, make sure that they're comfortable. Um, it's going to be a lot of supportive care. Uh, we want to place the position of our patient in their position of comfort, maintain their ABCs. Again, the adequate oxygenation, uh, establish IV access as well. And then pain medication is commonly, commonly used. Dilaudid is a really common one to use, or fentanyl is another common one to use uh, when we're dealing with choliocystitis. Morphine has, has had a lot of complications and contraindications um, because it can actually cause spasms of the cystic duct. That's actually leading to some of the problems with those because of the blockage of, uh, by those gallstones. One of the things that you'll see is right over quadrant abdominal pain. That's Murphy's sign. It's typically associated um, with uh, diffuse tenderness uh, on the right costal margin. Uh, you're going to see nausea, vomiting, history of choleocystitis in the past, 
And then again, we talked about those generalized treatments as well, too. Uh, pancreatitis. Pancreatitis is the inf inflammation of the pancreas, obviously by its definition. It can be classified as a uh, metabolic, mechanical, or vascular, and infectious-related type problem. So there's a number of different areas that can be impacted by this. Most of your metabolic causes, specifically, again, is associated with alcoholism. It's about 80% of the cases uh, that you'll typically see in the United States. Mechanical obstructions can be caused by gallstones or elevated serum lipids. That's about 9% of the cases that you may see. And then you've got vascular injuries, um, which can be caused, uh, uh, or shock can be caused, or be part of this, I should say, uh, as well. Um, uh, acute pancreatitis um, has a pretty overall high mortality rate, about 11% uh, is what you're looking at overall. Um, but it can even get higher than that, depending on which article you're reading. Mainly it's due to this, its company because it deals not only with shock, but it's an infection, so you're going to be dealing with septic shock along with it, and that's what makes it such a wide distributive problem uh, as you go through. Most of the time when you're thinking about pancreatitis, your signs and symptoms, they're going to be based on if it's a uh, mild or severe aspect. Um, if you're dealing with mild aspects, you're talking about epigastric pain, abdominal distension, nausea, vomiting, uh, lab values, you may see elevated amylase or lipase levels. And in severe pancreatitis symptoms, you're going to see, again, all of those as well, too. Uh, but you can even see some uh, additional components. So abdominal pain uh, to the left upper quadrant, rating into the back or the epigastric region, nausea, vomiting, and significant retching, uh, possible ecchymosis and swelling of the left upper abdominal quadrant. The patient is going to look acutely ill. There will be diaphoresis and tachycardia. And then they're going to have hypotension um, if there's any type of massive hemorrhage that's involved. Remember, the pancreas is a very vascular organ. So anything that's involving the pancreas is going to be a major concern. Hepatitis, there's a number of different components that we deal with with hepatitis, but all of these are going to be dealing with problems with the liver. Uh, so we can see that that can be hep A, B, C, D, E, and G, uh, alcoholic hepatitis, and then traumatic and other causes. All of those kind of go along with that as well, too. With viral hepatitis, we're talking about hep A. It's an infectious hepatitis that's spread through the fecal oral route. So have A comes from your ASS, uh, you fill that out, um, and it's self-limiting, typically in the last two to eight weeks. Hep B, you should be going through the process, or have gone through the process, I should say, uh, to be inoculated for this. Um, it's minimal, um, and again, it can deal with severe to um, uh, liver ischemia, and then even necrosis, where it's actually going to rot uh, your, your liver. Hep C, uh, common responsible for spreading through blood, right? So Hep C is for C for a circulatory system. Hep D, these are typically dormant um, pathogens that are dormant. D for dormant, uh, is activated by the HBV virus. Uh, and then Hep E is a waterborne infection. It's more common in third world countries where they in, in, actually ingest dirty uh, uh, water. Water maybe it's exposed to um, uh, fecal or, or urinary uh, uh containers or routes, whatever I call it, where your stuff all gets mixed together and they drink it. And then Hep G, the Hep G is very generalized. Uh, it's going to be people with hepatitis A, B, or C. They can all have what the super infected with the general hepatitis G. So most of your symptoms you're going to see is going to be, again, affecting the liver. So upper right quadrant abdominal tenderness, loss of appetite, weight loss, malaise. You may see gray colored stools or jaundice. Uh, you may see changes in the sclera of the eyes. Um, photophobia, nausea, vomiting is a light sensitive, uh, along with that, nausea, vomiting is associated with that. Most of your treatment, really, it's going to be hard to tell what they have if it's hepatitis related, other than looking to see if they have any type of hepatomegaly, if their liver is truly, truly enlarged. And then uh, being uh, proactive is the best bet in this, and that's where vaccinations come in for A and B uh, as far as those go. That is a lot of information uh, to try to digest no pun intended. Um, but we talked about the general pathophysiology. We talked about separating the upper and lower GI system. We know that the assessment is important. History gathering is important to determine if it's an acute or a chronic issue. Uh, and maybe it's an underlying issue that's now led to an acute problem. Uh, we talked about making sure to do the good physical assessment, right? Recognizing to inspect uh, and palpate before moving on to anything else. If there's pain in the abdomen, uh, palpate that last. Uh, and then if you feel any type of palpations or masses, stop palpating because we don't want to have any type of rupture uh, that can exist with any of our GI-related illnesses. The treatments are pr predominantly really focused on 
uh, airway management for concerns of aspiration, and then making sure that we're having adequate fluid resuscitation and shock treatment in those cases where there's significant hemorrhage or a likelihood of a massive systemic infection with leading to sepsis. So pay attention to closely to those generalized treatments. IVO2 monitor, uh, 12 lead for anyone who has abdominal pain is going to be really important to rule out cardiac-related issues. And then we went through a lot of specific issues uh, and illnesses that you may see in the field. Again, it's not something that we're going to have to differentiate between, um, but we want to be tuned into underlying issues and if there's any progression of those diseases. Hope you guys enjoyed this lecture. I know it was a lot to swallow. Ha ha. But we'll catch you here on the next one.